Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and in this video, I'm going to talk all about the so-called ENSO, El, Ni El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is a um, source of great variability in the climate system, and it acts, of course, on top of the trends from syst uh, climate system change increasing global temperatures. Basically, it has to do with the, the heat distribution in the ocean, namely in the Pacific near the equator and the atmosphere. So in the, there's a neutral state. In the El Nino state, the warm water is pushed from the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific off South America, and it releases huge amounts of heat to the atmosphere and global average temperatures in those years with a very powerful El Nino can be 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees Celsius warmer than the neutral state. And the concern is, well, a report came out recently saying that the chance of breaking 1.5 degrees Celsius global mean average temperature, that's relative to a baseline typically between 1880 and 1910, that 30 year average. So when we break one point, you know, the odds of breaking 1.5 in the next five years are 50%. So that's essentially based on the odds of there being a powerful El Nino year uh, being 50% in the next five years. The opposite state to the El Nino is the La Nina, which we're in now, we have a double dip uh, sort of situation. And that's when the equatorial Pacific is cooler. Something called the Walker circulation is stronger, push keeping the warm water pool in the West Pacific and along the equator uh, in the central towards the East Pacific, it's colder. And that's the state that we're in now. So in this video, I'm going to talk all about these, um, the ENSO and effects of climate change on the ENSO. And we don't know for sure um, what climate change is, is actually doing to these ENSOs. Most of the models show that you tend towards uh, more and more of the El Nino warm states and less and less of the La Ninas. But if you look at the data in the last um, few decades, uh, there's actually been quite powerful La Ninas. So, there's something going on that we don't understand, but I'll talk about the latest science of it. So I'm going to get into the um, my graphics uh, right away here. Okay. This has been a lot more work and preparation than I was expecting. And I got an email from the CBC Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is Canada's national broadcaster, uh, just yesterday, um, asking me to go on a bunch of interviews in various uh, CBC regional stations across Canada to talk about the forecasts for Canada um, weather for the summer, you know, the next three or four months, you know, and to comment on whether uh, we could expect uh, massive heat domes, uh, you know, huge numbers of wildfires, uh, perhaps atmospheric rivers, you know, things like that. So I, I did a sort of little, I talked in general about climate and the, you know, the effects of the Arctic on the jet streams. Um, I actually ended up doing 13 interviews in stations across Canada, and the link should be up. Um, I'll just show you some of the ones here. So I posted this in Twitter and also on Facebook, but so I started, I went from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. this morning. I started in Montreal. So I also talked about, um, uh, you know, regional, you know, what we can expect for climate in Montreal you know, over the summer, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario, Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, St. John, New Brunswick, Yellowknife, uh, Northwest Territories, 
Moncton, uh, New, uh, New Brunswick, Edmonton, Alberta, Calgary, Alberta, Victoria, BC, uh, Kelowna, British Columbia, Regina, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. So I had, you know, look at the times that I did. There were 10 minute gaps between lots of these and I talked for five to seven minutes. And the host and producers are all here. And uh, I posted this on Twitter and on Facebook. And this is the link to the station. And if you go to this station soon, then you can um, find the, uh, the um, my five to seven minute discussion on climate and extreme weather across Canada. And these are the sort of questions that I was asked. The likelihood of extreme weather events making a return this year, of course, very high. What kind of weather can, you know, Montreal, for example, expect to see this summer? So sort of a regional forecast and trends. General weather trends for Canada, a lot more variability, a lot more extreme weather events. Canada being a northern country, the temperature rise in the last, um, you know, 120 odd years has been you know, over two degrees Celsius, whereas the global average has been 1.2. So about double the global average. Is it becoming more or less difficult to predict our summer weather patterns much more difficult? And what precautions can communities take, you know, to deal with heat waves, um, floods, um, wildfires, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so those were all of the, um, th th those were, that's what I was up to this morning from six to nine. So if my voice starts to go, um, that's basically the reason. Okay, so let's go back to Climate Reanalyzer. Okay, so if you just click on Climate Reanalyzer, you know, from the home page, click on today's weather maps, click on uh, sea surface temperature anomaly. Okay, and then click on this to go to the different regions. And we're looking at the Pacific here. Australia and Indonesia, you know, Indonesia, this is the, the, um, the, the Western Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, the blue is colder than, is a negative temperature anomaly, colder than normal. And you can see the ocean here is colder than normal. This is the in indicative of the La Nina state. Weather is unwanted guess. Nasty La Nina keeps popping up. So this is some information on what's going on with this La Nina. Okay, um, something weirds up with La Nina, the natural but potent weather event linked to more drought and wildfires in the Western US, more Atlantic hurricanes. Okay, so the West's mega drought you know, in the U.S., parts of Canada won't go away until La Nina does, it says. It says the current double dip La Nina sets a record for strength last month. It's forecast to be around for a rare but not quite unprecedented third straight winter. Scientists have noticed that in the past 25 years, the world seems to be getting more La Ninas than it used to. And that is just the opposite of what their best computer model simulations say should be happening with anthropogenic climate change. These La Ninas don't know when to leave, says the head of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Forecast Office for La Nina and El Nino. An Associated Press statistical analysis of winter La Ninas showed that they used to happen about 28% of the time from 1950 to 1990. But in the past, past 25 winters, so from say 1997 to the present, they've been brewing nearly half the time, nearly 50% of the time as opposed to 28%. There's a small chance this effect could be random, but not likely. If the La Nina sticks around this winter, the one that we're currently in, as it's forecast to do, then it will push the trend over the statistically significant line which is key in science. La Nina-like conditions are occurring more often in the last 40 years. You know, we don't know why. The climate models say there, there should be less. Um, the, the climate simulation models, they tend to get conditions right over the rest of the globe, but, but they predict more El Ninos, not La Ninas, and that's causing contention in the climate community about what to believe. 
Um, what's happening is that the Eastern Equatorial Atlantic, it should be Pacific, I think, is not warming as fast as the Western Equatorial Pacific and even the rest of the world with climate change. It's not the amount of warming that matters, but the difference between West and East, because that determines the strength of the walker, so-called walker circulation. I'll talk about that more. The more the diff temperature difference, the more likely a La Nina, the less the difference, the more likely an El Nino. Um, and there, there could be a relationship to something called the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, could be caused by human-caused climate change or both. We don't know. So it's being studied. It's a, it's a, of course, the La Nina is a natural and cyclical cooling of parts of the equatorial Pacific, changes weather patterns worldwide as opposed to El Nino's warming. The La Nina leads to more Atlantic hurricanes, less rain and more wildfires in the West and agricultural losses in the middle of the country. So this is bad news. If we have, the world is relying on Canadian wheat and other grains um, this summer to, to uh, make up for some of the losses from Russia, Ukraine, and also India have not, are not exporting any grain. So prices are going up you know, a lot of food prices are going up and it's contributing greatly to the um, high inflation that we're seeing around the world um, in the last little while. Interestingly, the, the La Nina is more expensive to the U.S. than the El Nino. Um, together, the El Nino, La Nina, and the neutral condition, they're all called ENSO, which is El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere to have variability on the climate. It's one of the largest natural variability effects on the climate. Sometimes it augments and other times it dampens the big effects of human-caused climate change. Um, a third consecutive La Nina year is not a welcome thing. The dangerous heat in India and Pakistan was exacerbated by this La Nina, um, okay. The, pre the La Nina that's presently going on, it start formed in late summer of 2020 when the Atlantic set a record for the number of named storms, strengthened in the winter when the West drought worsened in the early summer of 2021, it weakened enough so that conditions sort of became almost neutral. But that neutral or pause only lasted a few months by early fall 2021, it was back making it a double dip. Now, normally the second years of the La Niñas tend to be weaker, but in April, this La Niña set a record for intensity based on sea surface temperatures, very impressive values. The La Niña has its biggest effect in the winter, and when, that's when it's a problem for the West because that's the rainy season that's supposed to recharge area reservoirs. The West is in a 22 year mega drought about the same time period of increasing La Nina frequencies. Three factors, ENSO, climate change, and randomness are biggest when it comes to the drought, which is itself a huge trigger for the massive wire, wildfires that we've been seeing. Without climate change, La Nina and bad luck could have made the drought the worst in 300 years, but with climate change, it's the worst in at least 1,200 years. Okay, La Nina is a very important player. It may be the dominant player. Okay, um, La Nina, it amps up the Atlantic storms, but decreases them in the Pacific. It's all about the winds, six to seven miles or 10 to 12 kilometers above the water surface, the jet streams. One of the key factors in tropical storm development in the Atlantic is whether there's wind shear, which, change, which are changes in wind direction depending on the elevation, whether you're high up in the atmosphere or low. This wind shear can decapitate or tip over hurricanes, making them hard to strengthen or even stick around. So wind shear can also let dry air into hurricanes that chokes them off. When there's an El Nino, there's lots of wind shear. It's hard for hurricanes, but we're in the La Nina. There's very little wind shear in the Atlantic, so it's easier for the storms to intensify quickly. And this is a huge factor, okay? So there's effects around the world. In the U.S., the La Nina costs the U.S. agriculture between 2.2 billion and 6.5 billion um, 
per year, whereas the El Ninos cost the U.S. on average 1.5 billion, you know, a neutral, and so is best for agriculture, okay? So that's a lot of details on what the Nino is. Here's where the temperatures are measured at the equator. There's three regions, Nino 4, Nino 3, and Nino 3.4, which is a combination of 3 and 4. So this is an example of an index. This is the El Nino in the red, La Nina is here. You can have weak, moderate, and strong. And you can see 1998, huge El Nino set global temperature records. Then the more recent one is in 2015, 2016, which goes off this graph. Um, and that blew away the temperature records from 1998. And then you can see the La Nina's here. And notice, interestingly, a lot of them are this double dip. Okay, you get a drop, a, a, an increase, and then a second dip. So this one here, for example, you know, was very powerful. And then it went to almost neutral, and then it dipped again and came back. But you can see the amount of blue in the last, say, 25 years. You know, this one here is exceptionally strong, lasted a long time. But the blue here, the area of the blue is at least equal to the area of the red. So we've been having, you know, about 50-50. Whereas if you go back further, there's more reds than, than blues. Okay, so that's a key point. And that's, you know, here's, here's a map. Um, these are, the red is the El Nino months. Gray is neutral. Blue is La Nina. And when you get an El Nino month, you get a spike. So if you look, if you compare to the gray, you know, follow the gray up, the spike is, uh, you know, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. This is why, you know, the concern is the next strong El Nino will cause the global temperatures to blow away that 1.5 degrees Celsius guard band um, for the entire year. Okay, uh, when you have strong La Ninas, the drop, you know, you can have the drop of about 0.2 to 0.3 from the neutral state. Okay, so it's, a, it's that variability that's interesting. This is a little, little more information on the record years of 1998 and 2016 for El Ninos. Um, you can see here's a 1998 spike. Um, and remember, people said, you know, the denier community said the denier community, you know, and their anti anti community really said that there was very little warming since 1998. Well, of course, they picked 98, which is a strong El Nino year. And then 2016 shut them up. It, you know, it blew them away with a massive El Nino. And if you look at the sort of background you know, the 2016 El Nino raised the global average temperatures that year up to about 0.3 degrees Celsius. Um, if you look in more detail at these two spikes, you know, and offset them, offset the 2016 one so it overlaps, you can see it has a very similar uh, feature uh, to, the, um, to the large El Nino in 1998. So very, very powerful. But of course, in 2016, the background... Uh, level temp of the temperature was already 0.4 degrees higher. So, so that's why, you know, when you add it to the climate change uh, trend, um, the El Ninos are really push up those spikes in global temperature. Um, so, you know, we're warming, we were 0.4 degrees Celsius warmer in 2016 versus 1998. That's 0.4 degrees in 18 years, which is 0.22 degrees Celsius per decade, more than the long-term global warming trend since 1980, which is 0 0.17 degrees Celsius per decade. Okay, so, so this is why the argument is that the chance of exceeding 1.5 in the next five years is 50% because that's the odds of having a very powerful El Nino in the next five years. This is some more information on the global temperature record, um, the effects on what happens uh, when there's, uh, you know, El Ninos, El Nino and global temperature. I showed you this um, and, and so, so on. I won't dwell on that. Okay, so this is from Noah. 
um, a May 2022 ENSO update piece of cake. So the La Nina continued through April. Forecasters estimate a 61% chance of a La Nina three-peat for next fall and early winter. Um, so this is uh, this is similar to the this is the climate um, reanalyzer type um, image showing the cooler. You know this is the sea surface temperature anomaly showing the cool water here. Um, and uh, so the anomaly, of course, is a difference from the long-term average. In this case, they use 1991 to 2020. They looked at the Nino, Nino 3.4 region, which I showed you. You know, the, there's the 3, the 4, the 3.4 in the central uh, equatorial Pacific. When the sea surface temperature anomaly um, in the Nino 3.4 meets or exceeds minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. We're in La Nina territory. April 2022, April this year was minus 1.1, which was tied with 1950 for the strongest negative April anomaly in the 1950 to present record. Okay, um, this is the three year evolution of all double dip La Nina winters. You get the first winter, you get the second winter. Sometimes you go up, you know, this is a 0.5 cutoff. So, you know, here, like this, this is the present one, the, the black. So we went into strong La Nina. Then we went into neutral for just a couple of months. And now we have the double dip here going on. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the seasonal forecast for the Nino 3.4 region surface, uh, sea surface temperature, this is the threshold, minus 0. 0.5. If it's plus 0. 0.5, it's the stronger than that, it's an El Nino threshold. And this is the model, you know, here's where we are right now. And this is the model showing it stays under, it stays as a La Nina and with with a, well, it's 61% probability that's under the line. The whole curve here is 68%. Okay. Um, and then, you know, one of the effects of the La Nina is, is drought, persistent drought in the Western U.S., which is ongoing and is, has been, you know, is not getting better. Okay. Um, the, uh, this is uh, another, you can get lots of data from NOAA on the sea surface temperatures. Um, you know, there's different, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, climate.gov on their, their website. You know, there's basic questions asked about sea surface temperatures and where do the measurements come from? How do we get them like satellite data plus uh, data taken from ocean buoys, etc. You know, why does the data matter? Well, the oceans cover 70% of our planet's surface. So we need to track the temperature of the sea surface to figure out how much heat energy is in the ocean and how it changes over time. And when a lot of heat is released from the oceans, as in El Nino's, um, then we set global temperature records in the atmosphere. And when more heat is absorbed in, and not released uh, in the um, oceans, then we have the, the opposite, the La Nina phase. And these things are both superimposed on the global uh, warming. Um, this is some actual data. So this is 1950, the El Nino anomaly. And let's go to the present here. So you can see, you know, this, you know, it's below minus 0 0.5 is the cutoff. So here it went neutral. It went neutral for three months. Okay, then it was back to the La Nina. And when did this thing start? You know, um, this, the, the eighth month, August of 2020, it dropped below zero minus 0 0.5. So the El Nina, La, the La Nina officially started. And you can go back and remember in 2016 and 2015 and 2016, there was a super powerful El Nino and these numbers went up. Look how high these, these anomaly numbers went up. So it was, it seemed to be strongest the, uh, in, in November of 2015, the last strong El Nino. And then you can go back to 1998 and have a look at that. Um, you know, in 1998, it peaked in, in January of uh, 1998. Okay, actually it was higher here. 
uh, November of 1997 was seemed to be the highest, 2.48, and you can see the duration of it, etc. So th this this uh, chart is very very useful, um, and it's linked from one of those NOAA sites. Um, okay, so the there's an alert system. It gives you the information on the criteria. You know, when we have El Ninos, when we have La Ninas, okay, this is also from uh, the climate.gov site. Um, now, the walker circulation is an important concept. Um, and, you know, it's connections between the atmosphere and ocean for these this ENSO phenomena. So I like this. If the ocean is Abbott, then the atmosphere is Costello. If the ocean is Laverne, the atmosphere is Shirley. If the ocean is Kane, Kenya, I don't know. You know what? I don't know how to pronounce that. The atmosphere is Kim. This is Kane West and Kim Kardashian, right? Atmosphere, ocean, intricately linked. And I'm just going to show you uh, the images here. And I'll go down to the bottom because this is the best uh, description. Okay, so this is the neutral state. Okay, so you have a uh, so-called... Uh, walker circulation and its circulation. So you get a lot of very warm water here off Indonesia and Australia. You get uh, a lot of evaporation of the water, a lot of water vapor rises, forms these clouds, and then it spreads out to the east and to the west. The east part here comes here, it cools down, and it descends off uh you know north america and then you get a you get the pacific walker circulation here and then you have another loop here descending the air is also rising here and descending in a second loop okay um so this is what happens in the in the neutral state so um this is fairly um okay so this is neutral this is el nino neutral and now i'll go to or enso neutral and now I'll go to the El Nino. So what happens in the El Nino is that the um, the warm water starts to slosh across the, and you can see also the neutral state, there's no colors in the ocean. Okay, so ocean sea surface temperature is so-called normal or neutral. Now in the El Nino, the warm water here sloshes across the Pacific towards South America. Because the warm water is concentrated here, you get most of the evaporation of the seawater here, and you get the convective uplift of the water vapor condensing into the clouds here, rising, and then it spreads out this way and descends, and spreads out this way and descends. So you get this warm water here, um, and clearly that affects uh, global weather patterns. Okay, so that's the El Nino pattern. And then the La Nina is the opposite, okay? Uh, you get a, an actual strengthening of, of the um, updrafts of the water vapor. And this is, so you get a, a stronger circulation loop. You have very, very strong trade winds here that push the warm water and keep it collected on the West Pacific, whereas the the warm water, when it's pushed away from the land, then you get upwelling of cold water and you get cold water here. So this is the equatorial pattern that you see, the cool water here in this region. So this is the present state that we're in right now, the, the La Nina. So it's good to just kind of flip from here. So neutral to El Nino, back to neutral to La Nina. And th this is uh, one of the largest sources of variability in the climate. Of course, this is happening on top of uh, the warming trends and the La Nina spikes in temperature. Can, you know, there's more heat coming out of the ocean in the La Nina. So the global average temperature can increase 0.2 or 0.3 degrees just from this uh, La Nina condition. And that on top of climate change, warming spikes up and causes, you know, will blow away global temperature records and will soon, you know, with 50% probability, take us in this state in the next five years. 
And uh, this is ex the climate models show that this state will be reached more often, you know, as the warming continues. But the data is showing over the last few decades that we're getting half the time we're in La Nina, the other half we're in El Nino, whereas previously, if you go back even further, the La Nina was only uh, happening about a third of the time or 28% of the time. So this is an interesting um, puzzle which needs to be solved, but that's the gist of it. Now, uh, of course, I love Earth Null School. You know, I'm looking at the ocean, the currents, the sea surface temperature anomaly. This is what you see right now. You know, very cold temperatures here, which is indicative of the strong La Nina. And you can see the currents here. Um, you know, the currents, um, which are, they're not very ordered. They're not very strong, um, but they're, they're, they're adequate to push the, to push on the warm water and stop it crossing the Pacific at the equator. Now, I wanted to look at some of the recent scientific papers here, and I'm going to go over this fairly quickly. So I Googled, I went to Google Scholar, I Googled ENSO climate change and found a bunch of papers and I'll show you a selected number of these. So this, uh, this is open source. Increased ENSO sea surface temperature variability under four IPCC emission scenarios. So it looked at the sea surface temperature variability of the ENSO. Okay, and the sixth assessment of the IPCC reports no systematic change in ENSO sea surface temperature variability under any emission scenario. However, if you compare the 20th and 21st century, you see a robust increase in century long ENSO sea surface temperature variability under four IPCC plausible emission scenarios. So basically, um, this is another bit of a, a um, so, so basically the latest modeling, this very recent paper, the latest modeling shows that, um, I'm not gonna go into the details, but it shows of, of all these, uh, there, were, there were 43 models run, 34 of them showed an increase in the variability of sea surface temperature, nine of them, only nine of them showed a decrease. Um, and there was another, um, uh, there was another set of runs done, similar conditions. You know, again, the increases in variability of sea surface temperature greatly outnumbered the, the decreases, okay? So that was that paper, the effect of climate change on ENSO is to increase the variability, not necessarily get rid of La Nina's or, you know, enhance El Nino's, but to increase the variability. So, you know, and that includes, you know, the return period or the frequency is quasi-periodic, you know, maybe two to seven years, like there's a big variability. Um, emergence of climate change in the tropical Pacific, um, Okay, this was a paper, you know, looking um, looking at the characteristics of the ENSO, um, trying to find out how it how, how sea surface temperature affected it, how climate change has affected it, but I won't go into too much detail there. This is interesting. This paper is interesting. The response of global sea surface temperature and ENSO to the Atlantic and Pacific meridional overturning circulations. Okay, so you hear talk always of the AMOC. You very, very rarely hear any talk of the counterpart in the Pacific, which isn't doesn't really isn't really a thing, a strong thing. So basically what this paper shows is it says the and I remember I did an entire video recently on how it looks like the AMOC is slowing down and could perhaps shift into a different state and how that would impact us, but it would also have a strong impact on the um on the the ENSO. So what does this say? The global scale ocean circulation named the Atlantic Marindal Overturning Circulation could be slowing due to climate change, okay? So I had a video showing, yeah, that's happening probably. It's, it's happening, we could be near a tipping point. 
Studies suggest that a slowdown of the AMOC could trigger the formation of a Pacific counterpart. Okay, so if the AMOC slows down enough and shuts off, there's some studies that show we might get a similar type of system set up in the Pacific Ocean, which would transport upper ocean water into the North Pacific that is warmer and saltier than present day, and then have the water descend and return. So the ocean circulation pattern could rewire with more water being transported north. You know, so a Pacific counterpart to the AMOC, a Pacific Meridional Overturning Circulation, PMOC. There you go. If you, have, you probably haven't heard of this before. It's not mentioned very much at all. Using several century scale, fully coupled climate model experiments, this study shows that different states of these circulations, the AMOC and PMOC, could dramatically alter Earth's climate and ocean temperatures. Um, significantly, an AMOC slowdown could increase the strength of the ENSO oscillation. Whether or not a Pacific meridional overturning circulation develops or not. Okay, so what it's saying is if the if the AMOC slows down, the ENSO variability is going to strengthen and the, there may be such a thing called the Pacific Meridional Overturning Circulation, which develops or it may not develop. Uh, but if it does, it could amplify climate extremes by a tropical, extratropical teleconnections. Okay, so this is a very significant uh, finding. Um, also, there, there's a paper here, changes in ENSO-driven Hadley circulation uh, variability. So the Hadley circulation is that circulation where the air rises at the equator. It spreads to about the 30 degree minus at 30 degree latitude regions in both the north and hemisphere, north and southern hemisphere, and then descends down, right? And then and then past the Hadley, there's the feral cell at, you know, from 30 to 60, and then the polar cell from 60 to 90, right? Remember those models? So basically with a warming climate, the Hadley circulation can become stronger and push things out further, changing the regions of des desertification, et cetera, having huge impacts. So um, the contributions of the ENSO-related sea surface temperature dominate the zonal mean changes in ENSO-driven Hadley circulation. So, you know, the whole system is connected. I mean, it feeds back into that the Hadley circulation. Just wanted to point that out. And so atmospheric feedbacks under global warming, you know, there's there's lots of papers on this. I think this is a very mathematical and statistical one. Uh, yeah, this one divides up the, and so it looks at the details. So you can have um, different types, different flavors of ENSOs where, you know, you have the Western Equatorial Pacific, you have the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, you have the Central Equatorial Pacific, and those are the Nino 3, Nino 3.4 is the center one, and Nino 4 is the Eastern one. So this would be Nino 4, Nino 3.4, Nino 3, and it looks at the strength there and looks at the, you know, how that affects things. So that gets into a lot more details about the ENSO, and I don't think I'll, I just wanted to mention it. ENSO predictability over the past 137 years. Uh, this is a paper, uh, you know, Chinese uh, authors looking at how predictable this thing is and how it's changing. Um, and they're trying to find, is there a climate change connection? Okay, and, uh, yeah, the jury's still out on that. Um, now, of course, you know, we talk about climate variability. The ENSO is the largest source of climate variability. Um, so there's actually a book, um, Coastal Geology, that talks has a whole chapter on climate variability. There's also papers on the effect of climate change on tropical cyclone intensity, right? And, uh, you know, the sea surface temperature is warming, so the intensity of tropical cyclones, what we're seeing generally is that we're getting more high-end ones, more category three and above. 
um, and we're getting, you know, also they're uh, strengthening very, very quickly. You know, like you can go from tropical storm to category five, you know, in sort of a day's time frame. you know, very strong intensification. So, you know, this looks at how the temperatures are changing and that also feeds into the ENSO and there's also connections, of course, to the AMOC. So predicting climate anomalies, a real challenge, you know, some of the ways that we can predict the, you know, the ENSO dynamics and the interactions, the effects on the monsoons. There's so many different parts of the climate system that are affected by the ENSO. I mean, it causes global effects, of course. And uh, the Australians have a study, Understanding Climate Variability, and they tie the, um, they, you know, they suffered these horrible wildfires. So what they found is that these long-lived coupled ocean atmosphere ENSO and the Indian Ocean Dipole also came in. And when these things were synchronized, then we had massive <coughs> dryness, heat waves, <coughs> excuse me, and wildfires in Australia. Okay, so this is their interest. <coughs> El Nino years tend to bring drier and warmer conditions to northern and eastern Australia. The sign and strength of the teleconnections depends on the El Nino flavor. So in other words, you know, is it the Central Pacific that's warmer? Is it the Eastern Pacific that's warmer? Or is it the Western Pacific <coughs> that is warmer, mostly from the El Nino? So they look at it in order to try to determine, you know, what, how, how is this affecting Australian climate and the fires? So consecutive Indian Ocean Dipole and El Nino events in 2018 and 2019 contributed to the extremely hot and dry conditions over southeastern Australia, leading up to the catastrophic 2019-2020 Australian Black Summer bushfires, those massive uh, fires, okay? So they're, 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 con they're, they're all connected. And this is something, a topic for, it's, it, for, something, for, for another video. Does climate change influence Russian agriculture? Okay, it'd be interesting to know, you know, uh, you know, if it greatly improves Russian agriculture, which I don't think is the case, then, um, you know, they can be more isolated from the world, you know, attack people, be isolated from the world, but still be, have enough food to eat. So this is a paper, um, if you're interested, you could Google the title, it's open source. I may end up doing a video on this. Okay, so basically I've covered a lot of things. I'm basically, in summary, I'm talking about the La Nina that's ongoing now. Um, it's a strong one, it's persistent, okay? And it's affecting climate worldwide. You know, um, it's keeping us from setting global temperature records, although, you know, we're still in the top 10 year. And so even though this is going on, causing a 0.2 or 0.3 degrees Celsius cooling of the global average temperature, we're still in the top 10 setting record. When this switches to a powerful um, El Nino, which is expected in the, in the next five years with 50% probability in the next five years, we're going to likely blow away the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature guard band. So um, just to remind you, uh, please check out my website. Please consider donating to support my um, research and videos. And I think my next video is going to be all about Dereshos because I'm sure you've heard of the, the strong Duresho, uh, which had uh, various uh, downdrafts embedded in it that um, affected huge numbers of people in Canada. Um, in Ottawa, at the airport, we had 120 kilometer hour winds from the Duresho. The speed of the Duresho straight line winds was about, you know, 90 kilometer plus um, in the Ottawa region. Um, it knocked out huge, um, it knocked out, you know, over half a million uh, homes from with power. And in Ottawa, there were, you know, hundreds of thousands, I believe, or 150,000 you know, people without power. I was very fortunate, didn't lose my power. 
friend of mine, uh, he lost his for um, about uh, five or six days, you know, and uh, now we're, uh, you know, a week and a half after the, um, after the storm, and there's still, uh, I understand there's still thousands of people in Ottawa uh, that have not had their power restored. They've had no power for, you know, a week and a half. So this was, and, and uh, you know, one of the reasons is that um, some downdrafts, you know, okay, I said winds were 120 kilometer an hour um, at the airport, uh, but there were winds in concentrated areas that must have reached 180, 190 kilometer an hour, very strong winds because they were enough to completely knock over these massive uh, transmission towers um, in parts of Ottawa, in other regions of this um, derecho, the, um, namely near north of Toronto, Oxbridge, there was an EF2 tornado that was spun off. There's not, that's not so common. It does happen from time to time, but the derechos are straight line winds. And, uh, you know, you, you need the rotation, of course, to trigger the tornadoes. There was some, obviously, in Uxbridge generating the EF2. And there were other tornadoes. There may have been a small tornado also going through Ottawa from this um, event. So, anyway, please check out my website and uh, please consider donating to uh, my PayPal um, to uh, support my, my research and videos. And I'll follow this up very shortly this video with one on the straight line winds, the derecho event that affected many, many people in, in Canada. So um, what else can I say? Um, follow me on Facebook or friend me on Facebook um, and, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter, um, on my Twitter page. Um, just search for Paul Beck with Twitter. Um, and, uh, you know, please, uh, widely share, um, this information, the, 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 uh, um, you know, I was very happy, you know, it's been a good day doing this video and also having interviews five to seven minutes long, um, with CBC regional stations in 13 different cities across Canada. You know, CBC is Canada's national broadcaster, so everybody... That listened in learned about the arctic warming the lowering of the temperature gradient to the equator the jet stream slowing down and becoming wavier therefore increasing the frequency severity and duration of extreme weather events and also um having extreme what causing extreme weather events to go to regions where they didn't go before and uh tried to explain you know if you recall you know, Canada had a temperature record broken, the overall temperature record, hottest place in Canada ever. In um, Lytton, British Columbia reached 49.6 degrees Celsius. It was over 45, 46 Celsius for three days in a row, and then a wildfire uh, burned the town down. So I also talk in my CBC interviews about how people can make themselves more resilient. For example, you know, if you have a place um, along a river or lake or ocean and it's flooded frequently a couple times in the last few years, make sure it's elevated. Otherwise, you're just going to have grief going forward or move it, move it away from the water. Um, if you're in a wildfire prone region, then uh, put on a metal roof um, next time you replace your roof because cinders often are carried long distances in wildfires, landing on roofs of structures, burning the structures down from the roof downward. You know, so just a metal roof where the thing can't ignite the building, you know, is, is a good mitigation. For heat waves, cities need to have cooling centers, either a library or community center, you know, for cooling people that don't have air conditioning, they have a place to go. People need to stay hydrated. Um, older people need to be monitored if they're on their own so that they don't run into problems, especially in unconditioned apartment buildings. The very young are also affected. Also people um, on medications. Medications can often reduce the resilience or tolerance to heat and people need to recognize the signs of heat exhaustion, um, so that they actually can take action to get to a cooler place. If they let it go on too long, 
uh, heat stroke and death fo can follow very quickly, you know, easily in the space of uh, eight hours, especially if the wet bulb temperature is high, if the humidity is high. And uh, I did a video recently on the wet bulb temperature. 35 Celsius is, is theoretical and 100% humidity. It's more like 31 Celsius and 100% humidity. In actual fact, for young, healthy people, older people, younger people, vulnerable people, people in poor health, uh, will actually be even lower. So this is a very important thing. So anyway, thank you for listening. And uh, I'll, you can catch me soon um, with my uh, Duresho video. Bye for now.